news agents investigates. Something is stirring across Europe. Slowly, then quickly. A tectonic change to our politics, to where the balance of our politics sits. We are the people. Radical elements of the right, even far right, once consigned to the fringes of political life, are growing in number, in parliaments, in power. Islamic ideology is a threat to our freedom. They did in 45 for the Jewish people. It's the same. Zionist people say we can rule the world. The, the world is for, for us and the rest is slaves. I'm very worried. I'm mad. I'm angry because I think he's a new Hitler. They're poisoning the blood of our country. That's what they've done. The invasion on our southern coast. From Italy to Germany to France, Argentina, Spain, Sweden, Hungary, the UK, and now most recently the Netherlands, the far or radical right have captured the conversation, the power to shape how we think, the power to move the center of the political axis to the point where they don't even seem extreme anymore, that they've become normal or mainstream when both they and what they're saying are neither. On this episode of the News Agents Investigates, the rise of the far right, the collapse of the center, why liberal democracy is under siege. In Amsterdam, across Holland, as Christmas and a new year nears, the country's liberals peer around the corner and they shudder. Around that corner is Geert Wilders, a perennial fringe candidate of the Dutch far right for over 20 years. I believe Islam is a, is, a, is a violent and dangerous religion and even a retarded culture. Among other things, he's advocated banning mosques, banning the Koran. I asked for the banning of the Koran because it's a book that is of incitement of hatred. He's called for climate change measures to go through the shredder. He's called Dutch Moroccans scum. That are being harassed that are being terrorized by often, not only, but often um, 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 uh, Muslim youth, often Moroccan youth. He wants to leave the EU. To liberate Europe from the monster of Brussels. He's pro-Putin and he wants to stop all aid to Ukraine. He is the only member of his party, the only one allowed. He was once banned from the UK because he was considered so extreme that he might be a threat to public safety. Well, I uh, couldn't have a better welcome, I hope. And yet, in November's snap general election, called on the issue of migration, his PVV party came first. He could be, is likely to be, the next Dutch Prime Minister. Dutch liberalism, the Dutch left, the centre-right, the Dutch political establishment have been shaken to their core. He scared people. At this protest in Dam Square, he's compared to Anton Musset the leader of the Dutch Nazi party. So you're worried? I'm very worried. I'm mad, I'm angry. Already 20 years ago I found him scary because I think he's a new Hitler. They voted for him because the, the racism is deeply rooted in this society. But why the change? 20 miles away from the demo, a different political world altogether. Volendam, a fishing village in deep Holland, it's quintessential small town and a place which had 57% of the vote for Wilders. Two themes emerge quickly. The cascade of repeated immigration crises ripple through Dutch and European politics. It's uh, uh, a man like Trump. He's like Trump? Yeah. Yes, that's... He's a Dutch Trump. Yes. Yeah, I think it's a lot about immigration and a lot about uh, um, things that uh, Europe uh, has... Uh, 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 forced us to do. I, I, I also want to live on Hawaii and give and get all the money. Uh, everybody wants that, but yeah, that people are not the people that need uh, help, mm. I think. And you think Wilders is speaking to that, is yeah, addressing yeah, people's yeah, concerns yeah, yeah. about that idea yeah. of people gaming the system or, yeah, or yeah. taking advantage of the system? Mm. It's only uh, immigration mm. that he wants to stop a little bit. And do you think immigration should be stopped? For the gold diggers. <coughs> yeah. We have a we lot are small, of people. Small land oh, with yeah. 90 million people. Yeah. Uh, Got too yeah. many people here. 
The many people, yeah. And the idea that Wilders can be controlled, that he's moderated, and his ideas are less extreme than they seem. If, if you are in a government, you have to make, uh, how do you say that? You put uh, water compromise. in the wine. So yeah, you make a, com- uh, uh, yeah, a compromise. Uh, so I don't think that everything he says is uh, uh, really forced that way because he says uh, uh, all the Islamic people have to go out. Uh, uh, that is n- that's a statement that nobody uh, wants. You don't believe it? You don't no, think no, 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 I don't believe that. No, no. So immigration is basically absolutely central to the dynamic of all European politics right now. Certainly in Western Europe, you can tell in terms of talking to voters here, but it could be any country virtually. And we see those echoes in Britain as well. And I think the most central thing is this, politicians, mainstream politicians, so-called, who constantly rail against immigration, constantly say basically what a bad thing is, how it needs to be stopped or brought under control, and then failing to do it. And not only failing to do it, but actually overseeing massive increases in immigration, it is absolutely creating a profound political effect and discontent with voters. And they're just thinking, well, if we're going to have someone, if these politicians constantly walk the walk in terms of using the rhetoric around immigration, use the rhetoric around that the far right have used increasingly, we might as well have someone who actually just does it. And that is where the far right come in. And the reason, of course, that politicians, nor more mainstream politicians, don't reduce immigration is because they know that over the long term, it's what Asian European economies need just to keep the wheels turning. But it feels like the gap right now between the politics that electorates are willing to accept and what the economies need just to keep going is absolutely vast. Mainstream politicians aren't filling it with reasoning as to why they're doing what they're doing. And the people who are filling that vacuum are the far right. Before we go any further, we should define our term. The far right is on the rise and it means something specific. Could you just give a very crisp definition of what you mean by when you talk about the far right and how they are different from the traditional conservative right? Yeah, the far right um, consists of parties that the, the core ingredient of their ideology is an exclusionary form of nationalism. So they're nationalists, right? They, they focus on the own nation. But in addition, they argue that the nation is being threatened by dangerous others. And that can be many different groups. That can be immigrants, can be people uh, of another religion. When it's Muslims, it's Islamophobia. When it's Jews, it's uh, anti-Semitism. And they combine this outlook with a more authoritarian vision, which means that they have an understanding of society that it should be strictly ordered and people who break the law should be punished severely. So these two combine. The first one is called nativism. The second one is called authoritarianism. Parties that endorse both messages are called radical right. Unlike anything, the far right is a spectrum. Orban in Hungary is the best example of an authoritarian far right leader, someone who dismantles democratic structures. There's no doubt though, that the new radical right forces, the populist and far right, whatever you call them, as different as they can be, have been growing in strength in recent years. Look across the map, Le Pen in France, Maloney in Italy, the Swedish Democrats, Traeger in Portugal, AFD in Germany, Vox in Spain, Law and Justice in Poland, or in the Anglosphere, consider how a taken over Republican Party has spoken of dismantling democratic institutions. You know why I wanted to be a dictator? Because I want a wall. It doesn't get more far right than that. And on the populist or radical right side, there was UKIP, the Brexit party in the UK, even taking over parts of the Conservative Party, a Home Secretary talking about invasions in its wake. The British people deserve to know which party is serious about stopping the invasion on our southern coast and which party The conservative centre of gravity has shifted. Take Rishi Sunak, just last weekend speaking at Georgia Maloney's pet project Radical Right European Conference. Then we must have a deterrent. People must know that if they come to our countries illegally, then they won't get to stay. It's as simple as that. 
whatever you call them, these forces are new, different to the more moderate liberal conservative forces they've often replaced. Wilders, for what it's worth, rejects the accusation he's far right, but there can be no doubt, whatever you call him, he is deeply anti-Islam. He has even claimed that Islam and democracy are incompatible. The Islamic ideology um, is a threat to our freedom. And that aggression has a cost. Utrecht, like the rest of the Netherlands, has a substantial Muslim population, long settled. Many are terrified. We are very concerned, actually, about if, if he uh, uh, comes prime minister, because his party program is very clear. He said, I will ban the, the mosques, close the mosques, ban the headquarters for Muslims. Yes. And he forbid uh, Islam, actually, he, because he thinks that the Islam is not a religion, but an, an extreme ide ideology. Understandably, Dutch Muslims find him a, a, an a unpleasant, frightening figure. Um, what will that do to the relationship, relations between Dutch Muslims and how they feel about the Netherlands and how they feel about Dutch people? Because you can imagine, I would have thought, just looking in from the outside, that it's inevitable that Dutch Muslims would take that deeply personally and perhaps not even feel welcome in their own country. Uh, correct. Uh, we are... Uh, because the, the uh, problem is, actually, it is not that uh, the, he gets uh, 37 uh, sitting. Yeah. But uh, the problem is that 53% uh, 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 of Dutch people, once he comes... Uh, Prime Minister, I am afraid from that uh, You're scared idea. Of that. Yeah, yeah. And all the Dutch people just looking. D they did in '45 for the Jewish people. It's the same, and I think this is the the, the history is uh, uh, how do you say uh, repeating itself. Repeating it. You, you feel that strongly. You, you feel. I, I feel. Exactly. I, I hear some some uh, far right people is uh, about uh, age of uh, 20, 25 years old. They saying sometimes go to your home. And I am actually more Dutch than that people because I am longer in the Netherlands than them. But I cannot go anywhere, but especially my children. They can go. This is this is our country. So one of the things I'm most struck by in terms of being here is actually, maybe Israel Gaza aside, just how uncharged the politics seems to be at the moment. In the sense that you compare it to say, what the US was like in the aftermath of Trump, aftermath of Brexit, other elections, where there's been a really surprising result. Actually, there doesn't seem to be that much backlash towards Wilders from the sort of quarters that you would expect, kind of liberal opinion. And I think there are two reasons for that. One, Dutch voters seem to have a lot of faith in the system to kind of tame him, to contain him. Well, recent and not so recent history kind of suggests sometimes that that is not always an assumption which is borne out. But also, I think it is even more about the fact that Wilders, as a man, and also the sort of politics that he has, that he espouses, has become mainstream. It's become normalised. Politics has moved toward him in so many senses in terms of his relative political position he's not far right he's mainstream right some of the big main parties made a bit of a strategic error in the way that they treated wilders um, in terms of letting him focus the debate on immigration and on issues which he was strongest on uh, and also by making clear during the campaign that they'd be willing to consider going into coalition government with him which made it a lot more palatable to vote for him and made it seem like voting for him wasn't a waste in the way that it might have been in the past. The normalisation has happened everywhere because a transformation has happened on the centre right. The breakdown of what used to be called a cordon sanitaire, a refusal to work with the radical right or far right forces has happened in most places in Europe. But it's more than that. Often the old centre right parties have simply become combined with or at least often aped what they used to oppose. 
Well, that's definitely one of the reasons he did so well, I think, is um, after almost 25 years of campaigning daily on against immigration, against Islam, saying he would ban the Quran and close down mosques and so on. In just the last two or three weeks of the campaign, he quite suddenly pivoted to taking a much gentler line. Um, since the election, he said that those issues he's put in the fridge and he's not going to discuss them anymore. Um, others have pointed out if you put things in the fridge, it's because you want to keep them fresh to use them again later. But um, he certainly, well, in this country, people called him uh, Builders uh, and then Milders. So a bit like saying he used to be wilder and now he's milder. There was a twin process going on, which is that mainstream, quote unquote, centre right parties were moving towards him. Yes, I think that's right. They've kind of converged on what might be a fairly right wing, but more centrist position than what Wilders would normally take. And that's created the space for him to potentially put together a government with other parties on the right of the spectrum. What many of the centre right parties have done in the last couple of decades, even um, across Europe, so not only in the Netherlands, but in many different countries, is that they have incorporated elements of the ideas of the far right in their own discourse. They've moved towards the far right to quite some extent. And there is a lot of research showing that that is indeed the case, in particular when it comes to an issue uh, such as immigration. Um, so these parties have moved into their direction and thereby they have uh, legitimized uh, uh, policies of the far right. In country after country, what we're seeing is a new normal on the right, a fusion which is often governed by the more nativist instincts of the old far right than the conciliatory liberal ones of the old center. Thus, normalization happens, buffeted by crisis and a political center which seems to have little to say or to offer to voters. What would have once seemed extraordinary no longer does, but it's not just high politics where the weight of the extremes is lengthening. <laughs> As polarization was already worsening, in city after city across Europe, we pour the gasoline of the Gaza war. Free, free, Palestine! Free, free, Palestine! Free, free, Palestine! Free, free, Palestine! And we see on the left and the right the power of conspiracy, of hatred, rising. Uh, that's very wrong to say it's a hate mark because people everyone here is is here for one thing, it's for peace. Uh, we're not advocating violence, we're not advocating terror, we're advocating peace and humanity, and this is why we're here today. But there are some people who, Jews in particular, who find this very scary. Uh, they shouldn't do, they should be solidarity with us, I believe, and most of the Jews are. And unfortunately, their, their voice is not being um, heard because the Jewish media is, is keeping that quiet too. So, what do you mean yeah. the Jewish media? What do you mean the, the media from um, the, the bias side? Say like the BBC and all that. They've said many things, but there's no documented evidence. No evidence of what? No evidence of what that the terrorism didn't happen. Zionist people say we can rule the world. The, the world is for for us, and the rest is slaves. What do you what do you think about Wilders apart from being? Is it an actor? Is a faker? Do you think it's he's a fake. fa Do you think he's a fascist? No, no, I don't use this word because uh, many people they, they say when you say fascist it's, it's the same as nationalist and this is for me a big difference. But he's for me not a fascist, and I, I don't use this word at all because people don't even know what it means nowadays. I don't. But you think he is a a puppet? A puppet. All the puppets. Most politicians are working for multinationals, working for the shadow government. They get paid uh, uh, indirectly, directly by dark forces. So yeah, we have to expose them. And you them. think specifically he's a, a your he's word, trained. A he's, maybe he's a Mossad agent, yeah, he's trained. You think he's, Wilders is a Mossad agent? Could be, could be, yeah, could be. Seems a bit outlandish, doesn't it? No, I'm used to talk about these topics. I, I know this for many years, so for me it's normal. And into this void, as ethnic tensions have risen, steps the grassroots of the far right, the sort of people that you would expect. So many of the people here, I do not find myself in a situation where I am thinking in primary colours, when I am thinking in binary. In so many ways, I leave here more confused than I was when I came in, in terms of exactly what I think about these marches, about exactly how they interplay 
and fuse with wider discussions around anti-Semitism around Israel and Gaza. One thing where I am absolutely certain, though, is that at a time when this debate is becoming more and more binary, is becoming more and more polarised, of all people, our politicians have to be judicious in the language that they use. Because right now, week after week in Britain, this issue is feeling more and more like a powder keg, ready to blow. And if politicians are adding ammunition, adding fuel to that powder keg, then I don't know where we're going to end up. In all times of crisis, we see the far right mobilise and try to take advantage of the news cycle in order to push their existing agendas. So, right, we saw it around the COVID lockdowns mm. when there were huge mobilisations and a spread of conspiracy theories and a real burgeoning of that movement. We've seen that again since the October 7th attack. We've seen a huge rise. And we've been able to evidence a rise in anti-Muslim hatred and anti-Semitism online and also offline, right? We've seen a huge spike in incidents, particularly in London. The Met Police recorded a 1,300% increase in anti-Semitic incidents. And so we have this context where we have increased polarisation, an increase in disinformation, misinformation online and conspiracy theories, and an environment where communities feel increasingly scared, increasingly concerned about the rise in hate towards them. And all of this creates the kind of environment where people take advantage of this element of fear in order to push their agendas and, and promote what we believe to be forms of hatred. Throw in new forms of technology which allow conspiracy and misinformation to spread like wildfire as we saw on the streets of Dublin just a few weeks ago. And before we know where we are, we have riots. And don't underestimate the extent to which online conspiracy videos are moving the overall debate, however subtly legitimating their radical ideas. We've seen over previous years, for example, how the conspiracy theory around the Great Replacement, so the idea that there is this kind of perceived invading force of Muslim individuals coming and trying to destroy British culture as the conspiracy theory goes. Take our place, literally. Take our place, exactly. We've seen that conspiracy theory grow and be normalised on, on different forms of media, um, in different political parties, and that's not always using the very overtly harmful language which white supremacists or neo-Nazis might do. It's using language which is kind of repackaged as accessible for the public in order to gain traction among communities who wouldn't consider themselves to otherwise be extremist or racist. Politicians have to respond to public concerns, which are completely legitimate. They also have to be wary about the language they use and aware of the seas they're swimming in, of how much of our public debate has been re-geared, how the centre of our politics has shifted, how crisis and technology are forging a new set of forces in our politics, forces which don't share the assumptions of those who governed most of the post-war order. These forces could have profound consequences for climate, the EU, Ukraine, immigration, community relations, the sort of countries we live in. If traditional liberal democracy, still so young, deserves to survive, someone has to speak for it. Who right now really is? The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 